I want to introduce uh, our next session, and that is the new landscape of oil and gas. And this is basically, uh, we'll be discussing uh, the evolving nature of technological advancements, regulatory risks, commodity market uh, pricing dynamics, in, which drive uh, investment and business decisions. Our moderator is Dr. Michael Orlando, and he is the managing director for Econ One Research in Denver, Colorado. Michael is an economist and a fellow petroleum engineer with over 30 years of experience working on a broad range of issues in energy and resource industries in general, in upstream and midstream oil and gas sectors in particular. His consulting practice advises organizations facing complex commercial, financial, and political risks, and those seeking expert analysis and testimony in judicial and regulatory uh, settings. In addition to his consulting practice set activities, Michael is a lecturer in the Global Energy Management Program at the University of Colorado, Denver, where he teaches courses in, on valuation and capital structure, political risk analysis, strategy, and energy business issues. Prior positions for Michael include Vice President of Research for a Business Analytics Startup, Vice President and Economist of the Federal Reserve Bank in, of Kansas City's Denver branch, and he was a reservoir engineer at Shell Oil Company. Michael earned his BS in Petroleum and Natural Gas Engineering from Penn State, not, CS, not CSM, but that's okay, <laughs> an MBA from Tulane University, and an M MA and PhD degrees in Economics from Washington University in St. Louis. So, welcome, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm, I give these talks quite a bit, but I'm not used to having to sit in a chair and like behave. So I <laughs> usually feel more comfortable if I can get my nervous energy walking back and forth here, but then I'll just be distracting. So I appreciate your patience as I muddle through being in this confined environment. I hope uh, we've really enjoyed these sessions. This has been very informative, so we're, we're really flattered to be invited to be here with you. I hope you find this one informative also. In this session, we're gonna step back a bit um, from, from maybe uh, some of the sessions that we're focusing on particular issues and think about the variety of forces that are driving investment and operating decisions in Colorado. What, essentially, think of it as what are, those decision, what are those issues that are keeping you up at night? And frankly, if we're not uh, talking about those issues that are keeping you up at night, I mean, we had a good conversation on the phone and in person in advance of this, so we, we think we got a pretty good talk here. But if we're not hitting the things you're interested in, there are those cards on the table, please say, you know, actually, these are the things I'm worried about. I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about this. Hold them up, and I'm going to try to get the uh, staff to bring them to me as soon as possible, and we'll just kind of go off script at any point. Okay? Um, so uh, let me do a few quick inter introductions. With me today is Jason Oates. Jason is Director of External Affairs for Crestone Peak Resources an independent EMP player focusing in the Rocky Mountain region with offices in Denver and Firestone. He's been with Crestone since their inception in 2016. Jason is responsible for the government affairs, community relations, community sustainability and investment, and communication functions at Crestone Peak. He's also responsible for leading the company's strategy and planning for operations in Boulder County and recently negotiated agreements for oil and gas operations in the Colorado municipalities of Erie, and I'm not gonna say this right, but is it Decono? Decono. Oh, see, I said it right. <laughs> there you go, I'm one for one already. Prior to joining Crestone Peak, Jason was Senior Manager for Regulatory Affairs and Public Relations with Encana Corporation. Jason was a commissioned officer in the US Army. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the US Military Academy at West Point and an MBA from the University of Arkansas. And then also with us this morning is John Ecker, CEO of Genscape, a pioneer in real-time data delivery and market intelligence for energy businesses. Genscape operates the largest private network of in-field monitors integrating these data into analyses for intelligence for the broad spectrum of energy centers, from oil and gas and NGLs to ag agriculture and biofuels and electric power. As CEO, John creatively and passionately builds on Genscape's core value to provide the highest quality data, analytics, and workflow tools faster than any other organization. 
John has over 20 years of experience organizing and analyzing energy industry data to create innovative and new products focused on electricity, coal, oil, and gas markets. Formerly senior vice president at Genscape, John led the natural gas business unit. In that time, his team significantly expanded the company's data footprint, accelerating Genscape's unmatched position in energy markets. Prior to Genscape, John worked with Global Energy Decisions in the intelligence division and with S&P Global Platts leading their database and spatial products team. John is a regular energy thought leader, contributor, and speaker specializing in explaining the global relevancy of highly technical data that Genscape collects. John attended the University of Colorado and designed and taught an energy market fundamentals course and market design course at Leeds School of Business at CU Boulder. So please uh, join me in welcoming our panelists. And thank you, thanks for your time. Well, John, I ended with you, so why don't we begin with you? Um, actually, are our slides, oh, they are. Our there we go. All right, can you go back one? So. Uh, I just want to make sure this thing works. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, because Genscape gives you a unique perspective on the industry, um, a very broad perspective with all the data that you collect, proprietary da data, and then integrate it with, with the data that uh, us uh, commoners have access to. Can you walk us through the current pricing environment and what that means for Genscape's view of production volumes going forward? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, you know, Genscape approaches market analysis, fundamental market analysis, from a very different perspective than most organizations will. We don't forecast price. We use price to inform the fundamentals. So uh, I figured that I would start with a bit of a view on where the forward curves are, where the prices have been over time, and how that relates over the past uh, 10 or so years. Um, broadly, you know, the the the, the the abundance of oil and gas in North America has been priced into the forward curves as we see them. Uh, some things to point out of note here are that uh, the, the gas curve, the Henry Hub curve, which, curve, which is the, uh, the red line at the bottom there, is, is hovering right along that lowest cost point for the coal range. So that dark shaded section that we see there is the, the price at which coal, can be, uh, coal, coal generation can be produced. So the gas curve is priced in such a way that it is very attractive over the five year forward look uh, to be burning natural gas as opposed to burning coal. Uh, obviously we see that the ethane markets have, uh, have been a bit beat up and I'm sure you guys have experienced that. Uh, we do see a little bit of recovery in the forward curve uh, in those markets as well as, uh, as some of the propane markets. And broadly, the LNG markets worldwide are going to be very attractive for North American natural gas. So then to talk a little bit about oil around the world. Um, you know, this is a long-term view back into the 70s of, uh, of natural gas, or sorry, oil production uh, via OPEC uh, and the United States. Uh, you know, no surprise, we saw the U.S. go into decline while the, uh, the, the OPEC nations were ascending uh, around the 90s. Uh, but of course, as you all know, uh, the shale revolution changed all that. Uh, and now we've been on an extraordinary run of growth broadly for these markets. The forward curve that we were just looking at, in sense, North American production of oil to grow significantly. Uh, you know, so you can see there at the tail end where we, where we have the dotted line running off, the dotted black line running off. We do believe that the United States at current prices is going to produce an awful lot more oil in the next five years than it is today. As we think about risks associated with that, one of the big risks is price, right? So if the price drops, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but if the price drops, we'll see less production. This is using the current forward curve as of, I believe, last week. Uh, one of the things about driving our analytics with price is that it makes it pretty easy to update it and get a current view. Uh, so uh, we see the prices right now as remaining, the forward curve prices as, as, as remaining fairly reliable. And a big factor associated with that is the, the, the OPEC production, the Saudi production in specific. One of the major factors associated with that production, the, with the consistency in price that we think is priced into the forward curve and the reason we think it will stay relatively stable is the Aramco uh, IPO. So as many of you may know, uh, 
Saudi Aramco has announced that they were going to do an IPO. They originally announced it that they were going to be coming out in 2021 with their IPO. They recently opened that window to be sometime between 2020 and 2021. And we believe that part of the reason that they opened that window is an urgency to get, while the prices are, are, are reasonably stable, an urgency to get the IPO completed mm -hmm. to get the best valuations they have. They have every incentive to, in, to cut production to ensure the prices remain kind of in this range bound 45 to 55 ish dollar range uh, through the time when they get that IPO completed. Uh, so, but that is a big risk in, this, in, in, in the rest of the fundamental data that I'll be talking about as we look through uh, the remaining components of, of, of the presentation and the discussion today. Um, on the, on the, so that is a risk we should all be aware of, keep an eye on. On the bright side, IMO 2020, where the low sulfur uh, you, bunker fuel is going to be coming into effect, that specifically as it relates to uh, our local uh, region, the DJ, <coughs> Uh, is, is a, a very positive influence because we've got an awful lot of light, sweet crude uh, that is good for uh, creation of, of fuels that, that meet the, I, the IMO 2020 specs. Okay, so that's um, really interesting because I'm always, being someone who teaches a lot, I'm always interested in trying to figure out what are those things I want my students to take away. So one thing I'm hearing to take away here is if I'm, there's lots of stuff to look out in the, in the newspaper and in the world of information we live in. But one thing that John points out is be watching that, that uh, IPO, right? Because that IPO is that key thing that is disciplining Saudi Arabia, who's really, when we all say OPEC, we all mean Saudi Arabia, is disciplining Saudi Arabia to actually care where prices are and kind of support them and probably take it on the chin for a little while if if the rest of the world goes crazy, if Russia starts producing like crazy, if the US starts producing like crazy, they're gonna adjust their volumes. Because John, I think, gives a really good argument for why um, they're, they have an incentive to make sure, at least for a certain horizon, that prices stay in this, in this range. So that's an interesting thing, though, to look at when you think about, okay, what are the risks to prices in this range? Pretty much maybe all bets are off once that IPO is finally completed. Because then the question is, does OPEC, OPEC's decision rule wind up relying more on OPEC and, and Saudi Arabia and Russia, more on internal and geopolitical considerations, internal political and geopolitical considerations, rather than right now, they're unusually focused on this commercial consideration. We're trying to basically sell some of our company. So that's really interesting, which suggests outside of this window, you know, that's one thing to look for, that's a takeaway, is when does that, op that, that uh, IPO happen? And then outside of that window, do we go back to really political risks being predominant again? And so speaking of political risks, we have Jason here <laughs> to, to give us some insight, and maybe uh, this is a good time to turn it uh, to a little more of a local conversation, which has really become, pol politics has become a big driver of the business locally. For sure. Um, you know, it was a year ago, I think, at this conference that we really started to understand uh, what threat the Proposition 112 had. So in a year, how far we've come and how, what we've kind of been through, through that fight, through that election cycle, uh, through the legislative process, which then gave us 181. And looking back, uh, you know, pre-181, it's, it's trying to, you know, explain this to individuals that may not be in this every day. Uh, I try to use the analogy of a football field and you look at you know, where our state was and how the rules were set up, it, it, it very much is analogous to uh, football in a way. Um, the structure, the, the, the uh, uniformity of the field, all the things were very much in line with where we were from, from a COGCC and a, and a regulatory perspective. Uh, we had the commission setting the rules throughout the playing field. Uh, the, if you look at the you know, teams and players as being on the field, you know, as operators that are in this basin, we knew what to expect from one end to the other and where the out of bounds were, what was expected, how we were gonna be judged on, 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 our, on how we uh, executed that part of the game. Uh, and so you take that now forward and in, in all this predictability, and this is really what we're playing on now. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, as, as uh, uh, Michael alluded to, uh, I'm a big fan of Army football, and so I think this was the field we've been playing on <laughs> up until recently. But no, I, uh, I think you, know, you do get this, this idea that now you have local governments who 
who then have uh, this control, and what are they going to do with that control? Um, we're still working through that. So we're in this period of, of very uncertain times where we're trying to understand what does the field we're playing on really look like? Um, what is, you know, going 10, you know, 10 yard increments at a time, what is the surface? How wide is it going to be? All that goes back to, you know, how do you really play this game and how do we really, um, you know, make capital decisions, make investment decisions, uh, make operational decisions, and how do we inform our staff, here's what's expected, and going, you know, locality to locality, uh, you start to see those, those variations, and, and, and especially for operators that have multiple locales uh, or, or places where they're operating, I think that's where it's going to be a real challenge if you spend multiple uh, local governments and having to deal in, in, in those areas. So um, this is really where we see it, and, and the uncertainty is really where we've got to play uh, over the next year, uh, year and a half as we go through the rulemaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is... Um we, we kind of laughed at this metaphor when, when Jason shared it with us and we're trying to struggle with, how the heck do you even think about this? Because it definitely, you look at it and you're like, yep, that's what it feels like. I was thinking that, you know, now what's happened is before each football season, you know, there's a rules committee that tweaks something about how much you can celebrate or something like that. Well, now we have, I don't know, 40 rules committees tweaking rules in their little part of the field about how much they can celebrate, how far towards the end zone, uh, are you out with your foot on the white line or out with your foot inside the white line and so forth. Um, we're going to come back to this in a minute and try to be more tangible because what I, th I think one of my concerns, this might be another hopefully takeaway point, one of my concerns as we move into this new environment, you know, really in a, in a way the, the, the new politics matters and the interface of politics and business, when you think about it, it is a natural evolution of advances in technology, specifically in information and communication technologies. The, the cost of organizing political action is so low. I mean, we can sit here and stamp our feet and be upset about it, but actually, to some degree, every industry is dealing with this. Because the fact of the matter is when you're an industry that, that people perceive to have some impacts on them, and we can argue about what perceive is, but if there's noise keeping my kid from doing his homework at, you know, in the evening because of a frack truck nearby, that's a real thing, right? It may not sound big in the scale of what we're doing day to day, but that's a real thing. Those folks can organize a lot more effectively now in the, in the technological environment we live in, and we have to basically understand that as just part of the new operating environment. And, and uh, Jason's going to get back to that, but before we get too much in that really new world, I thought it would be good to pivot back to John for a moment, because of course, even in this new world, politics isn't the only f operating factor we worry about. For the past decade or so, we were worried about uh, you know, other conventional commercial factors. One in particular were physical constraints in the region. Remember, over the past 10 years, how physical constraints was the top conversation. And whoever had a pipeline or, or was thinking about in pi investing in a pipeline wasn't doing it fast enough. So um, John's going to speak a little bit about that in these next few slides. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, from an oil perspective, and, and kind of broadly, the theme around uh, constraints uh, and mobility uh, and getting to market they're broadly disappearing at this point. Um, you know, as we look here at the oil pipeline capacity, uh, specifically for the DJ Basin, uh, it's just not constrained at this point. There's plenty of pipeline capacity. So, you know, we can get the, we can get the oil uh, out of the market that it's in. There are some other constraint points, of course, getting down into the Gulf and some of those things that are also uh, being uh, addressed. But broadly for the DJ, the, the concern around oil is no longer pipeline constraints. As we move on to the next slide, I want to take a look a bit at the risks to what we see as our forecast. So uh, again, our methodology is very much, we are not concerned about demand. We are not concerned about a market being in balance. Those things tend to find a way to take care of themselves. We look just at that forward curve. So what's been priced into that forward curve? And then what's going to happen for oil and gas, so we'll blend them. Um, and what's going to happen then? What kind of behavior will that forward price incent for putting holes in the ground and, and thus resulting in production of both oil and gas. So, uh, you know, as we look here, we're basically saying that at current prices in the forward curve, we're likely to see some growth, not a ton of growth, but some, you know, reasonable, good, relatively slow growth uh, inside of the DJ Basin in specific. 
but that is very price dependent. If we take $10 off the price in the forward curve, we're actually seeing some fairly significant uh, declines in production for this basin. And if you jump up $10 a barrel, you're also gonna see some pretty significant growth. So our view is at this point that we're sort of sitting in a sweet spot for this basin to get reasonable, fairly dependable growth. As long as prices continue to, to behave the way they are, which again, we think a major influence on that is the Aramco IPO, uh, we think that we're gonna be able to see some, some reasonably good growth within this market. So then taking a look a bit at, uh, at processing constraints as it comes to natural gas. This is an area where we have been highly constrained. Uh, the gas processing, there has not been enough gas processing capacity, so that's in the background there in the, in the grayscale. Uh, the actual performance is the blue line, and our forecast, of course, is, is taking off into the 2021, 20, 2020, and 2021 range. Um, and You'll also see here that the production forecast looks an awful lot for natural gas like the oil production forecast. That's because they're based on the same rigs, they're based on all the same methodologies, right? But, uh, but broadly, the, the story here is that gas processing capacity constraints have and or are, as we speak, being allevi alleviated. As we move to the next slide, you will see, though, that uh, the NGL issue, the, the takeaway for NGLs, has now become uh, a, a, an important topic. Uh, this is a constraint, though, too, that while it exists today, it's pretty much going to be disappearing by the, by the end of the fall here, so late October uh, and through the early part of next year. Uh, these constraints, too, are going to be alleviated. So broadly, as we look at this market, um, you know, at current prices, it's a pretty attractive market, and we no longer have to worry about a lot of the constraints that we have had for how we're going to get uh, the oil and gas that we have in this market to market. Yeah, that's um, interesting. So we, we have a range-bound price due to sort of a big incentive for Saudi Arabia to keep prices stable for a while. So we have some stability there. Um, on this operating side, we have a, a much less constrained environment than maybe some of us think about the Front Range and Colorado being for de developing hydrocarbons, where this was always a consideration we had to worry about. Um, one other thing that I did not develop a slide for, but that occurred to me, and I, I've talked to these guys about, is, is that an another thing that occurs to me about this industry that I, I think is fascinating is take a, well, I shouldn't say the whole industry, it's really the shale era. Um, take a, a look back to, say, 2007, 8, when Mitchell really finally started figuring this stuff out, right? He was experimenting before that, but it was really by 08 that we realized, and, and I don't know if um, uh, this is maybe a little bit of going all the way back to my petroleum engineering, geeky petroleum engineering roots, but I don't know if people appreciate what a, a profound transformation this was for the industry. The way, I, the way I describe it is, you know, what we used to do is we'd wait for Mother Earth to take a bunch of dinosaurs and vegetables and bake them for a long time. Then we'd wait for gravity to move them. And then a few million years later, we'd go to a nice sandstone. That's where I worked. Everything was, all the equations weren't much simpler. I was only in college 30 years ago, but I, equations were much simpler because you produced from sandstones and you had a limited number of parameters. But that was kind of the, the way you thought about how this product even came into existence. And when you think about what shale oil is, it was at some point, some crazy guy in Texas said, let's just reach right in the oven and eat the cookies now. You know, we're actually reaching into the source bearing rock. This is not something uh, literally that we, I think back to my lectures with my petroleum engineering professors, this would have been a mind blowing, ridiculous, <laughs> get out of class and stop wasting my time comment. Why are we waiting for it to be in the sandstone? Why don't we just, if that's the way, Petroleum geology works, why don't we go over there? You know, that would be a flunk out of school kind of logic. So um, this is really, when you think about it, we are in a very early stage of this industry. We think of this industry as going back to Colonel Drake's well at the very earliest time, or going back to like the, you know, the teens and the 20s where we really started to do industrial scale oil and gas development. But this industry, and everything that's driving the volatility and the curve and all the production growth, this industry is 10 years old. So one thing I think is very important to appreciate about that is 
uh, and this, I do, just want to bring it up now because John was talking about some of these, these factors in historical perspective. For me, in historical perspective, a big, a big thing that is going to be different in the next 10 years than was in the past 10 years is technological change. And I'm not saying that the industry won't continue to be innovative and creative, but in any new industry, you see step changes in technological improvements early on. You see people figuring out how to do completely different things with fracking than they were, you know, two years ago. You see people figuring out how to extend lateral lengths from 5,000 to 15,000 feet. The next 10 years is not going to be extending lateral lengths from 15 to 45,000 feet, right? The next 10 years is going to be incremental improvements, fine-tuning and perfecting what is now a more mature technological regime. And for me, that is another important paradigm for thinking about where we are going forward. And especially in the front range where we are, I think this, this uh, the takeaway constraints are enormously important because when I was at the Fed, I remember um, speaking in Wyoming, it would have been in like 04 or something. Right, and this was when coal-fired, well, this was when gas prices were much better. <laughs> but coal-fired generation was becoming more and more of a thing. And the problem was the differentials up there, I think U.S. gas was like $7 at the time or something, but in Wyoming they were getting $1.50. Takeaway has been a predominant consideration for something like 10 or 15 years in this region. And this is really an interesting, uh, I think important, thing for, for, for having a framework for thinking about the next 10 years is that you have probably a different capacity infrastructure here that feels a much more appropriate to the opportunity. And I personally think you, what's important for the next 10 years is that we have probably a different technological regime. Don't expect, you know, a service company to come bail you out of a, of a gamble because they're gonna come up with a new widget that makes it all work out. We're probably settling down, if you think about, well, well, we'll get to these later, but if you think about those break-even prices and how rapidly they move down around the country, they really, those break-even price declines around the country were in shale play areas. And they're not moving down now as rapidly as they were over the, say, you know, from 2010 or 12 to 15. So those are two important things, but of course, we're in Colorado, and we are in the post-181 world, so also a really important thing is how do you actually get things done in this now more stable technological, less, less takeaway constrained capacity, how do you actually get things done? Yeah, and I think it's the, it's the evolution uh, of where we're going, I think, and the, the evolving practices that we have within our industry. You know, we hear about it throughout this is how much innovation and how much improvement you've seen. But I think you're going to really see, based off of where we've come over the last year, uh, you know, the strong drive for evolution, both in the, in the commitment around safety and, and, and environment and ways we're doing things with, with air quality monitoring, air quality testing, those types of things, water quality. I think the big one is the use of pipelines. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the, the takeaway that you're talking about, but not only from uh, the midstream to the, to the downstream, but also from the wellhead uh, and, and bringing in the, the, t the pipelines um, you know, in these environments where you're trying to go virtually tankless. Uh, that's a large uh, selling point and a, a place where I, I see a lot of, of growth and evolution for our, our industry. Uh, but also on the, on the collaboration side, how do we work with local governments? Obviously that's where uh, we're really going to be uh, focused for the next several years. Uh, and, and we have been over the, over the past several years. Uh, it's not a new thing that just came about due to 181. We've been working with local governments uh, throughout this, you know, venture into oil and gas, and, and we'll get to, you know, why that is, but, it, you know, obviously they play a major role as a stakeholder uh, in this debate and in this development process. So you see the operator agreements that are getting done. Uh, you see comprehensive drilling plans, multiple operators proposing these geographic, uh, you know, plans that, that cover large uh, operations in large development areas. And then you also have the, 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 these governmental uh, advisory committees with citizens and with others. So I think all those start to play a role and really show how much collaboration there, there already is going on and will continue to go on. And then you get into the best practices. And those were, are really where you see the tactical changes, the things that, uh, where the innovation really comes in, where we've come with noise and using sound walls and, and using the monitoring and how 
uh, for a lot of you know for a lot of it, it's 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 proving uh, from an industry's perspective this is what we're doing. Right. We're we're trying to show you know yes you have a noise standard and we can prove to you that we're meeting that standard and we're, that we're able to to do things around that. So it, a lot of times it's the baseline monitoring to making sure you know what's there before you get there. Yeah. Uh, you know if you're near uh, a major road. Uh, when you show up, if you t start testing after the fact, then obviously you get into a different scenario. You own what's there uh, without doing that. So there's a lot of, and what we can do around those areas with odor, uh, with light pollution, um, I think we've seen a lot, you know, you basically turn it over to our, our innovators within our company and, and give them those, those, those types of problems. And it's amazing what you can see come out of those groups. Uh, and, and that's where I, th I think you see, because we talked about the impacts are really what the majority of the public, what they feel and what, what they complain yeah. about and where, and where their, their problem with our industry really lies. So I think that's where you'll start to see the most uh, innovation and improvement uh, yeah. going forward. Even though we've come a long way from where we were, uh, you know, who knows what, what, what's next on, around yeah. the horizon. And I want to dwell on this a little. It was funny when Jason and I started talking, I think we we're going to have like a 15 or 20 minute chat and I think we wound up talking for an hour and a half on the phone about this because this was kind of a revelation for me and I have, to, I have to back up and like give myself a demerit here because I, when I was talking about innovation really calming down and the industry being innovated, I realized I'm again an engineer at heart because that's a real gearhead comment I made, right? Because what I'm talking about is pipes and all the cool stuff is not going to change as much anymore and all the men have made the changes in the past and and that's, you know, and now we're just at a mature industry. But this this is really if there's another takeaway coming up here, I think it's that thinking about where in the where in the organization in the nexus of relationships and activities in any organization are those innovations likely to happen? The way I really should have said it is don't expect them to be better packers and pigs and pipes and all of that stuff. Actually, it's organizational activities. That's where your opportunity is to, to innovate and create. Instead of looking at post 181 as this is impossible, well, of course, we'll, at lunch we'll be able to, uh, to ask the governor whether this is impossible. But this is a conjecture. Right? There's two ways to look at the future, the present and the future right now. One is wring your hands and say, this is impossible. We don't know any way to even think about the mess that has been imposed on us. Because I went to engineering school to understand pipes, and I went to geology class to understand rocks. But I don't, don't expect me to understand this nonsense. Right? That's one way you can do it. Another way is you can say, you know what? The, the nature of these organizations, the purpose of these businesses, is to simply get stuff from the ground to, you know, the little flash nozzle that heats my home. That's it. And what are all the different barriers along the way? And some of them are conventional technical barriers. Some of them are commercial barriers about having correct contracts. Some of them are informational barriers about being able to forecast the future. And here, what we're seeing in Colorado is one of the opportunities for wringing inefficiencies out of the system is this, this line of business, this part of your business that's all about communication, community relations, regulatory relations, and things like that. So um, I think that's a really, you know, to me, when I look forward at the, this industry over the next 10 years, this is where I expect to see the ahas coming from this, this inform and what's really interesting actually is kind of cool is because these improvements, if one company makes them and shares them, they help everybody. This is a good, this is a good thing. You know, you think about some of the other improvements on the pure technical hardware, those were always thought about narrow strategic advantages, but the kind of improvements here are the ones that give the whole industry, um, a better relationship with the community and therefore improve the operating environment. So individual players actually have incentives to share many of these kinds of innovations. Individual players did not have incentives to share that I came up with a better drill bit, right? <laughs> that, was a, that was a strategic uh, competitive advantage to withhold that and, and appropriate that to yourself, this is a strategic competitive advantage to share it, which is kind of a, a different paradigm. So um, that's what, what I'm 
you know, at least anticipating going forward, which is kind of a, a positive, nice, nice thing. Not to get everybody holding hands all at once here, but we'll <laughs> wait till the end of the session for that. So the other thing I wanted to unpack just a little bit here is, is um, as you're thinking about getting things done, Jason, are you seeing um, systematic, so, sort of, are you seeing uh, common frameworks from location to location, again, to try to break us out of that logic that, oh no, when we go to location to location, it's just gonna be one political set of headaches versus a new political set of headaches, but in reality, we're all people. We all have a similar set of interests. What are you seeing as those kind of common buckets of things that you pretty much know before you even go to that community? Sure. They're going to ask you about check, 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 check. What are those things? Yeah, I think if you look at, you know, if you go from back to the analogy of the, of the, of the football field and you look at uh, where you stand um, and you go into a locale uh, or local government and you say, okay, you know pretty much where the impacts that they're going to be and no matter where you're at, they're going to be worried about really those those five things are on the list, plus uh, air quality and water quality. So you can really start to understand no matter where you're going, those are going to be the things. Like, the like if you go to a community and you were to break them up into a couple of like two groups, what would you say pretty much every community is always concerned about this thing or this is kind of a factor everywhere, whereas what would you say might be community specific? Can you give an example of each one of those? Sure. I mean, you, <coughs> obviously we're talking about the intent of those local governments and that we've talked about that a little bit is, is if, you're, if you get past the if you're going to operate or not, which is obviously a debate that, that is yeah. ongoing, uh, and you get to how, the how is, where, is really where we're going to see the improvements and really where we see the collaboration. So if it's how you're going to it, how you're going to operate, then we the noise is obviously one of the top mm -hmm. ones because that's one that that gets uh, felt um, by most in, everybody that's involved around yeah. the operation. And so uh, I really see that you see that as a common theme throughout operator agreements and throughout regulations is is really around no noise uh, and odor uh, and then truck traffic as well. Okay. Okay, and how about those idiosyncratic, unique to one community versus another? Do you notice any? I of mean, those? I don't really think there's a there's a there's a problem that only one local government yeah. has. Yeah, but has but there but some on, so. governments prioritize some things more than others. Um, I believe yeah, you see. I mean, you see definitely. Uh, I think uh, groups groups of organiz or groups of local governments that have similar Values. points on the, on the industry. Yeah, and and so air quality is a really big one in a lot of those uh, local okay. governments. Uh, again, it's, it's more or less how do you try to create a, uh, a framework for, or, you know, are you going to be able to? And that's, you, yeah. you'll see a lot of movement, I think, with this local government uh, control a piece as being how do we create these standards that you're not able to get over? It's almost right. that proxy ban on our organization, which we've got to unpack and understand yeah. a lot better. But if you can get past that piece and, again, get to how you're going to do it, uh, and how you're going to operate. But, but even in that case, giving those governments the benefit of the doubt, not assuming that they're, they're, just assuming their values are different, not that their motivation is just to shut you down. It sounds like what I'm hearing is there are a group of considerations that are immediate, right? I know if there's a frack truck working next to me and anybody who's not deaf knows this, <laughs> um, you know whether your car is dusty in the morning when you when you go out to drive to work and how annoying that is after you just washed it. Uh, you know, so those are kind of immediate impacts to a community, which obviously matter more the closer you are to density. Right. And then there are these, these things that you can imagine the industry could conceivably have long-term impacts on that are more like the air quality and the environment stuff. Those in principle people, you know, they may have values and care about those things, but it's not like they're literally waking up in the middle of the night saying, darn it, that well is too close to the dry creek I care about. Like, well, maybe they are, but it doesn't have that immediate impact as waking them up in the middle of the night like noise, right? And maybe it's that second bucket of those long-term impacts that you'll see be prioritized to more varying degrees around communities, whereas those short-term impacts seem like issues that are kind of uniform important across communities. Sure, and I think it's important for us as an industry to understand how we're, you know, in those regards, those larger, bigger bucket items, we're just a contributor and how, mm -hmm. you know, and, and magnitude of, of contribution yeah. is really where I see us participating the most and really setting that story straight and trying to make sure people understand that it's relative 
uh, and that we are just a player of, of all the other industries in this in this state right. uh, on that playing field. So yeah. All right. Well. Um, I could dwell on this for a long, long time, as you see. <laughs> but um, what I want, I think we've kind of established, and I don't know if I've advanced, or this is, do you have any comments on this, this last slide? This is really where, where you see kind of the, the next sort of frontiers? Obviously, yeah, the first two are very, I mean, I, I think are, are self-explanatory. We've got to get through the regulatory uh, rulemakings process, and we've got to learn what is it like to operate in this new environment. But, I think the, the third one there, the legal challenges, that's the piece I think that you're going to see, uh, you know, really start to come about as everybody starts to work through those first two. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that yet because on a, you know, on a facial challenge perspective for 181, I, I think it's, it's, it's you know, a, a very high hurdle to, to, to clear. Yeah. But as these rules uh, go into effect and uh, operators and mineral interest owners are <coughs> unable to develop their minerals, then you're gonna to start to see these legal challenges really start to come about and really start to uh, yeah. unfold uh, in, in the state of Colorado. Because that's the one part of 181 outside of the rulemaking that hasn't happened. It's not been legally upheld yet. And that's, I think, what we're gonna see. Right. And then as an industry, knowing where we were a year ago with, with we we're facing 112, it's what's next? What are we, what's over the horizon that we're facing uh, that we need to be prepared for and start to really work towards how do we make sure we're prepared facing those 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 existential yeah. threats uh, before we get there is it i don't i'm going to say something and maybe it's just wrong but is it um fair then to say what's interesting to me that i'm thinking as you're talking here in a way that legal challenge that hurdle we haven't kind of broken through yet to see what is there in a way that represents a positive risk instead of a negative risk at this point because we're essentially living in the environment like 181 is going to be upheld, and you guys Correct. are executing as if it's going to be upheld. Um, in the, I guess in the worst case, it's a negative. Would it be fair to say in the worst case, it's a negative risk if, if certain communities push it so far, that's where the legal challenge is, and it's upheld. Then actually, it looks like the 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 goal post has been moved a little bit to a much more difficult position. On the other hand. The fact that we haven't encountered the legal challenge could be a positive risk because if someone eventually challenges something and it's not upheld, the goalpost gets moved Correct. back in our general direction. So that's so that they are. There, there's definitely uncertainty. Think that I think there is there's definitely a, a, uncertainty a, a on both sides. Pro and a con, or yeah. a negative and a positive that you can see come out of that. And, okay. And uh, but uh, you know one of our things that we always talk about though is is how you know how you find good rock. Yeah. In, in the front ranges and good, look for good geology, you just look on the surface where the most people are yeah. because that, that's really that where the yeah. best rock is going. <laughs> so yeah. if, you go, if you go after that, I think John was going to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you just go I mean, look it, for the headaches. He'll prove my theory yeah, that exactly. most people are over the best. Well, uh, where would this be as hard as possible? <laughs> oh, that, well, let's drill there. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's one organization that has done their absolute best to find out <laughs> how hard you can kick those people and how they'll respond, that's you guys. <laughs> right. Hey, we just try to do our best. <laughs> so, thank you. So, um, John, I want to go back to you. So, what? So, Jason, uh, we spent some time talking about, obviously, there are still some res residual risks out there, but the fact that 181 passed has kind of just set a new operating uh, environment and playing field for us. Um, so, it's certainly all executing on those new types of uh, business processes that we used to not take very seriously and probably do much more now are going to be key to success. Um, I guess the, the last thing you were going to talk about is, so what is the prize we're looking at? What is the landscape of the target that we're going after? Yeah. Yeah. And so to make Jason's point, um, <laughs> you'll, you'll see here uh, that the best economics that we see in the DJ tend to happen right next to where all those people live. And a lot of those people having uh, a, a home in Boulder, I can attest that a lot of those people believe that everything about oil and gas is awful, except that perhaps it lets them have air conditioning and drive their SUVs. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in Boulder, we have a difficult time footing those two things with one another. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know, the economics in this region uh, you know, broadly tend to be better near where all those people live. Uh, and that's, I guess, been your guys' philosophy for going to find where to get the leases, so uh, well done. Thanks. Um, let's go ahead and move through to, uh, you know, sort of the, 
the view of the competitive nature of the basin, and what I actually think is you know, a, a pretty good feel-good story. Um, so this is, this is uh, the way that we see uh, cash costs for, uh, for the markets broadly. For us, that's uh, ignoring everything that happens up to the point where you spud, and then uh, up to the production of, uh, you know, of first day of production. And so that's how we look at these costs. Um, you know, the DJ is just in a super strong position. We've alleviated a lot of the capacity constraints uh, across all factors of the industry, which is, which is pretty exciting. As long as prices remain around where they're at, uh, we've, got, we've got productive margins, uh, you know, attractive margins for, for producing out of this market. And the market actually has much better economics than the vast majority of the rest of North America, uh, you know, in most cases. So, uh, you know, broadly for what it means to us and uh, what it means for our local economy and what it could mean for us from tax revenues for the long term, depending on, you know, what the governor does say today later over lunch. Um, you know, I, there's just so many attractive things about where we sit in this market that I actually yeah. think that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty positive story broadly. Right, right. Yeah, and it's interesting to, to me to think about if you imagine this slide over time, I don't know, maybe you know what this slide looks like over time. Was the DJ as competitive? Like if you were to draw this slide two, four, six, eight, ten years ago as it is there? Certainly not before we, you know, the fracking revolution, right? So No, no, but I mean, <laughs> but what, even within the fracking, um, I think the, the common sort of perception is, for instance, that the Bakken was the cheapest thing at one point, right? And that, frankly, was a little bit of a surprise to me. I don't discount it in any way, but I wonder what that chart would have looked like, say, uh, six years ago. What, right. Like, would we have been in the pole position like that? Well, I'm going to have a hard time doing the cash costs there because we weren't doing cash costs until about three years ago. But okay. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's really <laughs> more attractive now than they, than, than they, than they were then. Yeah. So. So um, I have a few questions here. I'm going to take the very first one because when I make this comment about technology, I always get a lot of comments back about that one. And it is that, um, that there are a lot of other factors where we are making new technological gains in the industry. So this person disagrees with my, with my uh, projection of a technological slowdown. Uh, refracts, EOR, digitization with artificial intelligence for lift optimization, supply chain practice optimization. By the way, that last one is kind of the one that I try to get my students to focus on more. The other ones are the more technical things. Not that they're, I'm not trying to discount them at all, but be thinking about organizational improvements. I really think that's going to be the frontier of competitive success for businesses actually executing frankly, just managing and executing relatively known technologies. But I guess my, my response to this is, you know, one of the things that, that made me think about, I've been thinking about this for a while, my thesis was on the economics of innovation and new technology. You can look across industries and there are in every industry, there is a learning curve of just how efficiently you build airplanes, cars, no matter what it is, there's a learning curve. That learning curve, you get up to a pretty efficient place pretty quickly. You have step changes, huge step changes in efficiency, and then it slows down and you have more marginal improvements. The auto industry doesn't stop innovating. Eventually, they come up with the airbag, they come up with fuel efficiencies, whatever. But those things are a lot different than literally replacing a horse with an engine. Like, that's a big deal, right? And then occasionally you have some big step changes like going from one type of an engine to another. Um, but for the most part, you see these efficiencies of how costly is it? When I say efficiency, what I mean specifically is how costly is it for you to deliver that car? And it basically, you know, I can drive the cost down and down and down and down and then it sort of, I can't really drive it down much more. There's just some residual point below which I can't make it a lot cheaper. One of the things that occurred to me was I think the EQT Rice um, merger recently, right? And some of the, I won't get into since I don't know it, but it sounds all salacious to get too much into the, to the internal politics of who knocked out who and control of that company. But a lot of, one of the problems for EQT if they grabbed Rice was they grabbed them while people were speculating, oh, we're gonna push these laterals from 
from, say, 10,000 feet to 15,000 feet to 20,000 feet. We think we can get to 24,000 feet. You know what happened when they got to 18,000 feet? They really couldn't get past 18,000 feet. I mean, they're just starting to get to some physical laws of nature based on the, the types of materials we're using and, and the buoyancy of the muds that we use and all of that. They just can't do it. And so when you think about one of the big, big factors that's driven down these, these break-even prices, it has been replacing wells. Taking, getting, I shouldn't say replacing, getting rid of wells. Having a pad of six that reach really far than having two pads of six, okay? And that anticipation of being able to do that, I have a hard time believing that we're gonna see the same step change in the total cost of investment on a well. Uh, I think we're gonna settle down to, you know, because that, that was to re reach a certain volume of hydrocarbon. It was all about, well, how many wells do I need? Well, each of those is eight, eight million dollars, whatever, you know? And if we could extend the lateral lengths, we were getting rid of those wells. That's what was really driving kind of the, the principal thing driving down these, these break-evens. All of these, I don't discount all of these optimizations that we're talking about are absolutely worth chasing and they're gonna pay for themselves and make us better and more efficient. But I think that's, that's a very different set of innovations going forward and will have a very different and more modest impact on this curve here that we're looking at than the really basic innovation of getting rid of wells and drilling longer ones. That, that was a huge innovation. So anyway, I'm happy to take a dozen more of those kinds of questions and have a table at lunch that just <laughs> discusses this topic, but uh, and my mind is open. Um, and so we have another question here. It says, the industry seems to define stakeholders as mostly state and local governments and regulators. What about direct outreach to regular Joe citizens who are not elected officials. And um, so obviously this is uh, something uh, for you, but John, feel free to, to pipe in because you have such a great perspective of the industry overall. And I think in particular, what I wanna sort of ask you to comment on is just communication as a part of, you know, as a part of what you're doing. Like, like uh, because this is really a, a matter of communication in general, maybe not literally one-on-one -on -one conversations with individuals, but are, are, are people perceiving what we're doing? Uh, are they perceiving the risks that we're mitigating the way that we know that we're doing it? I think that's maybe what's in this question. No, I, I think you have a very valid point. It, it's finding you know, who are the uh, stakeholders in that uh, group that, that want to be engaged with, and that's always been... Uh, you know, you can put out, you know, all these different ways of trying to engage with stakeholders, but it's the reciprocal response that you need to, you know, to, to be able to, uh, to have that dialogue. And so mm -hmm. it's trying to find those people and also trying to use all the different mediums. So we, you know, and being that we're a small company, we, you know, we have the communication group within our other framework, you know, with the, within the government relation, community relations. So there's crosstalk within that group is mm -hmm. fairly easy. I'll, you know, and when the, that group is external, it's trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to externally communicate and, and coordinate that when, when uh, organizationally you may not be situated that way. So I think there's some organizational things to help with that as well as how do we engage these different stakeholders in a way that uh, meets what our business practices are. And, and there's always improvement to be done. I mean, I think if, if you talk about how processes fail, mm -hmm. one of the key drivers of all the, you know, through, through that are a common theme is communication. And so we can always be better at how we communicate and, and, and where we communicate, uh, you know, whether it's social media, uh, you know, the conventional print media or, or just, right. uh, you know, how we find those different stakeholders that want to be engaged with. Yeah. I mean, it, and it occurs to me that so much of what you're doing that's then embedded in these contracts and, um, and agreements with municipalities, in a way, you know, part of the, I think maybe what this question is getting at is in some sense, so much of that effort is lost because the community, you know, the, the local uh, politicians and regulators, you know, let, let's, just, let's just take everybody at, at face value who are trying to all, we're trying to do our best, they're trying to do their best. They're hearing from their community what the concerns are. They're the agent, so you're interacting with them coming to an agreement. 
And then once they come to an agreement, they're happy and it's dropped. But are they ever communicating? Are they communicating back? Are there ways for you to get that? Look, you guys asked for this because your agent came to us and said you want it. Look, we delivered it. Right. Like, how does anyone know that unless they literally go to the county courthouse and <laughs> dig up your document? I mean, there are the public, pro there's the public process that usually goes with a mm -hmm. lot of those agreements. I think that's part of it. I think you're going to see some, uh, you know, I've heard some things around ombudsmen yeah. and the, you know, trying to find who are those honest brokers within right. our, you know, our social frameworks that, uh, that uh, you know, can be somewhat of that middleman between all the different <laughs> stakeholders and make sure companies are doing what they agreed to you know, we're addressing the, uh, the concerns that the actual yeah. citizens have. Because you're right, we do approach uh, these local governments as having the voice of their right. constituents, but that may not always be the case. And so yeah. we've just got to make sure that we are working with some sort of, of framework to where uh, we are getting that feedback. And, and we, we, we have, we've tried, you know, with all these different public processes of doing that. Right. Uh, and it differs from locale to locale and how motivated that group is to provide feedback. Right. Well, Michael and I got in an argument about this in our very first phone call <laughs> because I mean I do believe that there's there's a lot of work to be done especially living in the community I live in you know everybody in Boulder believes that gas, gas land is the Bible <laughs> and that water burns everywhere you frack and I mean that's a little bit of a gross exaggeration but it's there's the, that sentiment yeah. is there and I do think that we as an industry should be doing more to actually tell the truth about you know, how safe things are and the number of actual incidents there have been. Mm -hmm. Because this industry, when it is well monitored, and yes, there was a lot of issues in the early days when there weren't regulations and when, you know, all the people who would maybe go out to look at a well and do inspections were used to inspecting coal mines. Like, that's yeah. not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the industry has come a very long way. And I do like the fact that there's been a reasonable amount of marketing in the Colorado oil and gas markets about, about you know, how safe the industries are and how important the tax revenues are and the jobs are yeah. for our economy. So I think those things are great. I don't think they can afford to be ignored. Yeah. Um, you know, your point, I think, Mike, Michael, was that the, many of those things are just biases that probably can't be changed. And so you work around them and well, in some cases, you wash their cars for them or give no, them coupons no, see, to do here, that. Uh, here's my, and here's where I'd make a distinction between the two things you guys just pointed out. While I don't disagree with the scientific evidence that you cited, what I'm asking Jason about is something very different. What I'm asking Jason about is these agreements um, are basically commitments, pre-commitments to live up to a standard. What, what we, you and I were talking about on the phone are the evidence actually shows that fracking doesn't contaminate groundwater and people just don't get it. You know, in my experience, it doesn't matter if they don't get it, they're not going to want to get it because fundamentally, no matter how good the odds are that it doesn't affect their water, our, our, they look at our industry as heads we win, tails you lose, right? Tails they lose. They don't want to hear that, yeah, but it's only like a one in 500% chance that <laughs> you lose. No, it's still tails I lose, so that's it. But what, J what, what I'm talking about is not so much communicating more about the fundamental science, which I agree we need to keep doing because that informs the regulatory structure. But what Jason is doing is all this work that literally addresses every one of the concerns, and yet you still have a risk of someone showing up with a bunch of placards. And, and protesting when it's time to get the, get, you know, the bit in the ground or whatever. And is there, a, you know, may, maybe this is something for future conversations. You know, this is each, each company, for instance, could say, I'm posting all of these things that we did literally right here. You could go to our website and find it. Or um, is it something that Koga would be the right place to be showing, to, to be a catalog where all the, com all the, in, the uh, industry participants would stick their, upload their data so anyone could look at it? Or will the community say, eh, I don't trust them, they're not the convener that I trust? Would the local library be the right pro place? Well, just like, to be clear, Michael, I mean, all of these processes that you've seen uh, different operators go through in different uh, local governments, those have all been very public processes. Yeah. And, and, and those documents and those agreements have been you know, oh, yeah. out there for people. Who, again, it's, it's trying to find the stakeholders who really want to engage on it yeah. versus who just want to oppose it and, and, and be, you know, right. uh, opposed. You're so reasoned. Well. <laughs> <laughs> 
So my, my um, perspective on these things is always that, you know, you got, the way politics works is there's something called Black's median voter theorem, which really means the guy in the middle is the only one that matters, right? So if you can get to the person in the middle, because you have a spectrum of concerns, and you got about a third on one side that aren't gonna be swayed by a whole lot of evidence, a third on the other side, but it's really that middle third that is pretty utilitarian. If they can get food on the table at night and get their kid from soccer practice and get their kid to bed, and you know, it's not an ideological thing. And so making sure that that group isn't getting their message from one side or the other, but getting the, the you know, objective reality that you've helped create, I think is the, one of the most impactful things you can do as right. far as political influence. So um, I think we've extended our time because now we're being <laughs> flashed at by a red light. So I really appreciate your um, patience. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.